Welcome to the Exit Rich Podcast, where the leading authority on buying, selling, fixing, and growing companies, Michelle Seiler Tucker, is dedicated to helping you find the path to retire rich and move on to your next adventure by exiting your business for the desired dream price you deserve. Get ready to exit rich with your host, Michelle Seiler Tucker. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Exit Rich Podcast. I'm so excited because we're, we're actually having a famous person <laughs> um, that I'm going to be interviewing today. His name is William Cohen. And so William Cohen has quite the experience and quite the, the resume. And I tell you, um, I think he's pretty much done almost everything there is to do. <laughs> he continues he continues to create. So William Cohen is a former senior Wall Street M&A investment banker for 17 years at Lazard. I'm probably going to mispronounce this. Lazard Frise. Lazard Frere, which actually uh, started in New Orleans. Oh, it did. Yes. Probably off started by three, three French brothers who moved from the Alsace region of France in the you know 1848 area to New Orleans and opened a women's fashion clothing store and was in New Orleans for one year uh, when a fire swept through the store. They saved the inventory and then moved to San Francisco and opened a store to um, sell clothing and other merchandise to uh, gold miners during the gold rush. And then they got oh, wow. into the gold business and then the banking business. You remember what part of New Orleans? I'm just curious. Oh, goodness. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I assume that. it was, you know, the business district such as it was in 1848. Which is exactly where I am <laughs> on Poitras. So you're probably in now the old storefront that used to be Lazard Brothers. Store. Probably. <laughs> what a great bit of history. I'll have to go look that up. And then you've also have, have worked with Merrill Lynch and JP Morgan Chase. He is. Now listen to this, guys. I'm trying to make my first New York Times bestseller. I, I am a Wall Street Journal in USA Today. I haven't made a New York Times yet, but William is a three times New York Times bestselling author of nonfiction narratives about Wall Street. Interesting. Have any of those been made into movies yet? No, although no? there's talk of about one of them. Oh, the really? Amanda okay. Yeah. So you have to tell me which one. But Money and Power, How Goldman Sachs Came to Rule the World. Can't wait to read that one. And that was the first time Goldman Sachs Business Book of the Year award, right? Uh, actually, it was the book about Lazard called uh, the, Lost, the Last Tycoons was oh. the one that won the 2007 uh, Financial okay. Times Goldman Sachs Business Book of the Year Award. Congratulations. And then we have House of Cards. I love the name. A tale of Ubres and Richard. Richard, if I'm saying that right, Richard. Excess on Wall Street. Excess on Wall Street. And then anything to add there? That's the one that's uh, potentially being made into a uh, you know, TV series. And then there's a third book. What is the third one that I'm leaving out? Well, there's Last Tycoons, House of Cards, Money and Power about Goldman Sachs, all okay. New York Times bestsellers, and then a book called The Price of Silence that was about the Duke lacrosse scandal that was also a New York Times bestseller. What was that scandal about? That was your four friends, right? At Duke? <laughs> four Friends was a different book. Uh, <laughs> Oh my gosh, we have so many books I can't keep up. <laughs> yeah, uh, the Price of Silence was about the 2006 uh, uh, lacrosse scandal at Duke, where I went to, uh, where I'm a graduate, uh, and uh, so I wanted to write about what happened. And was that New York Times? No. That was New York Times bestseller. Yes. That was true. Okay. Yes. Awesome. And then you have a book that came out about four friends, right? Right, four friends of mine from high school called Four Friends. And then my new book, which is called uh, Power Failure, 
the rise and fall of an American icon, which is about the rise and fall of GE, General Electric Company. Yeah, so we're going to dig into that. So, and that book, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to all my listeners, comes out November 15, November 15th. So you need to race out and get your copy. We'll tell you where you can get a copy of, of The Rise and Fall of an American Hero, which is called um, Power Failure. So Power Failure, GE story. But let's talk a little bit more about you because you're so phenomenal. So for 13 years, William was a special correspondent at Vanity Fair. I love Vanity Fair. He also writes or has written for ProPublica, the Financial Times, the New York Times, Institutional Investor, Blue Book Business Week, The Atlantic Fast Company, The Nation, Fortune, Political, Art, Art News, and barons he pre now that's a lot i write for ink <laughs> he previously wrote a bi-weekly opinion column for the new york times an opinion column for bloomberg bloomberg view as well as for the deal book section of the new york times he is a non-stop on non-staff on-air contributor to cnbc and also appears on CN, cnn and in msnbc and the BBC TV. He also has appeared three times as a guest on The Daily Show uh, with Jon Stewart, The News Hour, The Charlie uh, uh, Lau Show, and then The Tavis Molly Show and CBS This Morning, as well as numerous NPR, BBC, and Bloomberg radio programs. He was formerly a contributing editor for Bloomberg TV. And there's more. <laughs> Like we said earlier, he is a graduate of Phillips Academy, Andover, that was known as, right, Andover, and went to Duke University and um, Columbia University School of Journalism and the Columbia University Graduate School of Business. He lives in New York City with his wife and sometimes his two sons. So welcome to the show, William Cohen. It's my absolute pleasure to have you here. Nice to be here. Thank you. I, want, I really want to dive into your book, but before I do, you just have, you've accomplished so much and you continue to accomplish and create and write. And I can't even, you know, was there anything that I missed? And what were you like as a little boy? <laughs> you didn't miss anything. Uh, you know, obviously I spent 17 years on Wall Street, but uh, that's, you know, ancient history and long and involved uh but uh, you know i had the typical uh uh upbringing middle class upbringing in uh, central massachusetts you know you, you know watched the three stooges and uh other uh you know sitcoms there were only three tv stations back then black and white tv that became color you know he, there was no uh no streaming, no cable, uh, no clicker to change the channels, you know. Uh, so, you know, you did your homework, you watched some TV, you read the newspaper, you know. Typical American upbringing in the early 1960s. So what was your favorite stooge? <laughs> Larry Corley or Mo? <laughs> you know, uh, I liked, uh, I liked Shemp. I don't know if you remember Shemp. I don't had, remember Shemp. Yeah, he, he had dark hair. You know, uh, he, he was a bit goofy. I know they, they were great. I loved the Three Stooges. My mother hated it when I watched them, but I, I loved them. So only and, three yeah. comedies, only three TV, only three shows. Yeah, there was only t right. only three TV uh, stations. You know, networks. Man, there was ABC, NBC, and CBS. Yeah. Wow. That was it. So what were your other favorite uh, sitcoms? Oh, I mean, I loved uh, I Dream of Jeannie and Bewitched and, uh, uh, you know, McHale's Navy and F Troop. People don't even know what that is anymore. Gilligan's Island. <laughs> you know, these are well, all great shows. You yeah. know, people talk now about the golden age of, uh, of television, but... Um, you know, back then, there were some great sitcoms, powerfully great sitcoms. I like Influenced the a whole generation of Americans. 
Yeah, I remember I Dream of Dreamy and Bewitched. I, I, I used to watch those for sure. Um, all right, so let's let's talk about, I mean, gosh, you spent 17 years on Wall Street. What can you tell what can you tell us about MA? You know, I do MA, I buy and sell fix and grow companies. I've been doing it for 22 years. Mm -hmm. Um, what let's kind of dive into MA. What, what do you see as the future of MA as as you knew it um in the past? Well, you know, M you know, you know this. Uh yeah, I know, but my listeners might not yeah, know it. <laughs> right. Well, I'm so saying, I mean, you know, M A uh, Advisory work goes through cycles when uh, valuations are high and uh, CEOs are feeling confident about the future of their company you know, um, and their stock prices are high so they can use the stock as currency. You know, there's a lot of M&A business. So, you know, in the last few years, not 2022, but 2021, 2020, you know, we're talking you know, several trillion dollars worth of M&A business. So, you know, kind of numbers that um, in terms of volume that, uh, you know, uh, that I, you know, when I was uh, in my heyday on Wall Street could only dream about. Uh, but, you know, uh, this year that's way down. And, uh, you know, because the markets, uh, you know, the equity markets are, uh, uh, have reversed. Uh, the debt markets are pretty closed. Uh, and, you know, the confidence level among CEOs is uh, way down. So uh, I thought interestingly, kind of, you know, this week, there are a couple of uh, uh, big deals uh, that are starting to happen. Again, Johnson & Johnson uh, bought uh, a medical uh, drug company and Blackstone bought uh a division of uh, Emerson Electric. I mean, so, uh, you know, things are happening a little bit, uh, but the volumes are way down and, uh, you know, that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was up in 20, 2021 for sure. Do you feel, I know you're like labels. <laughs> Do you feel we're in a recession, headed towards a recession? What's your thoughts? Well, you know, you're right. I don't, you know, people like to say, oh, my God, are we in a quote unquote recession? I mean, uh, you know, to me, uh, you know, th there's the old saying, uh, you know, recession is when your friend is out of work and a depression is when you're out of work. Uh, you know, at the moment with unemployment rate being so low, uh, unemployment uh, employment being you know near at or near all-time highs as long as people are uh, gainfully employed and getting paid you know they do feel the effects of inflation obviously eating deeper and deeper into that paycheck uh but as long as you've got a job and are getting a steady income uh you know it's hard to feel like uh, we're you know in a recession uh or the the economy is so bad uh obviously with the fed raising interest rates intentionally and deliberately and they'll probably raise another 75 basis points today that is going to ripple through the economy and uh access to capital is going to be more expensive and it's going to slow way down and that will uh definitely um slow the economy down whether it results technically in a recession uh you know remains to be seen. I don't really think it matters. Uh, you know, it, what matters is how people feel about how far their paychecks go, whether they can afford to buy the things that they need. Food is expensive. Gas is expensive. You know, everything seems, everything always seems expensive. Uh, and especially so today, um, you know, as long as that's the way people feel, um, then, uh, you know, that's not great uh for the economy uh but as long as they also still have their job i think you know we'll be okay when waves of layoffs uh start coming uh uh you know that's when uh you know people start really feeling it and when whether or not we'll you know technically be in a recession or not so mm -hmm. i think we're sort of pre-recession because layoffs are coming and the economy is slowing and that's going to mean more and more job losses and that's a sort of a, 
a spiral downward that uh, you know we'll all begin to feel soon enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think you know people are just going to have to budget, you know, um, and get rid of some discretionary spending. I see, I see that we're, you know, I see the the Fed's increase uh, of interest rates is definitely killing deals <laughs> and and slowing deals down. You know, we've we've got a sixty million dollar deal we're working on. Been under due diligence for a year, <laughs> and the buyers are like, "Okay, every day this is costing me money." So a lot of buyers are are kind of backing out of deals and, and very slow to pull the trigger right now these days. Then, anyway, of course, we have the midterms coming up, so you know people always want to wait and see, right? Yeah. So let's let's dig into your path. Do you have any other advice, tips on M and A? You know, selling companies because that's my bread and butter. That's my passion. That's what I do. Any any tips for the listeners on on mergers and acquisitions before we dive into your book? Well, I think you know we're in a period now where um, it's hard to get things done because uh, sellers' expectations are still high because you know we're just coming after off of you know stock market being at an all-time high and it takes time for people to readjust their views of what their valuation should be for their company and, and we're whereas buyers uh adjust much more quickly and they see okay the stock market's down the debt markets are closed um Cost of money you know, is all higher. You know, cost of money is higher. You know, uh, you know, the economy is looking shakier. Uh, you know, I'm going to cut uh, my valuation uh, metrics. And so, uh, in that environment where the buyers have adjusted but the sellers haven't, uh, you know, it's hard to get deals done. So, that's mm -hmm. all I would say about that. Okay. Well, let's dive into the power of failure, which I love the name talking about GE and the rise and fall of an American icon. So where would you like to start on your book? Would you like to start under Jack Walsh's watch? And you know what? I spoke, I actually met Jack Walsh. I spoke with him on stage. I shared the stage with him. He's very, very nice. It's got, you know, I tell you. Where, when was that? Uh, that was in 20, 20, what? Of course, you're going to test me on this. I have a picture with him back there. Mm. 2012, 2013, oh, 2014, okay. somewhere in that range. So, so yeah. after he was CEO. Correct. Correct. So, let's, do you want to start there? Why don't you give us a synopsis of your book? Why did you write this book? And then kind of like take us through it. Good? Sure. Uh, so, my, you know, my first, uh, and I was in, you know, as you've, were saying, um, you know, I went to Columbia Journalism School, and then uh, I was a newspaper reporter in Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, at the Raleigh Times, uh, covering public schools in Wake County, uh, which was a very interesting job, uh, very, very poor, poorly paying job, but interesting. Uh, uh, and then I went back and got my MBA from Columbia. And uh, my first job uh, after graduating in 1987 was working at GE Capital in in New York City, uh, financing leverage buyouts. Uh, you know, providing financing to take companies private or you know have buyout firms buy divisions of companies and. Um, so uh, I was there for uh, 87, 88, and then in uh, 80, uh, part of 88, 89, I was working for the chief credit officer of GE Capital in Stanford, Connecticut. So basically in two years, I had this incredible exposure to GE and GE Capital. And so, you know, I had that uh, in my experience, my professional experience. I'm, you know, I'm not sure I really knew what I was doing at that time, but I did it and uh, learned a lot. And then I went and worked, at, as you said, at Lazard, at Merrill Lynch, at J.P. Morgan Chase. And then, uh, you know, I, I left, in 2004, I decided to go back to, to writing. Um, and this is my uh, seventh book. Uh, and 
And uh, it turned out that by you know some sort of serendipity, uh, which I find extraordinary, uh, the guy who was my office mate when uh, I first started at uh, G Capital in New York uh, was a guy named John Flannery, uh, who uh, stayed at GE and then uh, uh, after uh, Jeff Immelt was the CEO, uh, who he was the CEO after Jack Welch, uh, John Flannery became the CEO. So my friend, who I'd known for 30 years, uh, became the CEO of GE. So that was quite remarkable. And, um, you know, one thing led to another. And, you know, my conversations with him over the years and when he became CEO, I mean, he would, you know, things were... Uh, un unraveling a bit at GE and uh, uh, he, uh, you know, would, you know, occasionally share with me, you know, how difficult it was to be the CEO of GE at that time uh, and how, you know, many of the things that have now become public, he was uncovering for the first time. Uh, he lasted, you know, and he would say to me things like, oh, you know, you should write a book about uh, GE and I said to him, well, I, I can't, John, you're my friend and you're the CEO. So that would never, uh, I, mean, I can't do that. Uh, I couldn't be, you know, objective. Um, but, uh, after 15 months as the CEO, he got, uh, you know, relieved of his duties, uh, unceremoniously and, uh, and unfairly, I might add. Um, and uh, so that's when I decided I would write this book to try to figure out what happened, um, you know, eff effectively, you know, this once uh, incredible company that uh, started in 1892, um, which has uh, to some extent uh, Thomas Edison, uh, the great inventor uh, in its DNA, uh, you know, and was the world's greatest conglomerate, the world's most valuable company, the world's most uh, admired company, the world's most revered company, uh, the company with this, the manager of the century, that was Jack Welch in the 20th century, um, you know, had, you know, was now in the process of dissolving and uh, beginning next year, it'll start breaking itself up into three pieces. And this company that was once worth more than $650 billion, the most valuable company in the world uh, at that time uh, is now worth a fraction of that, you know, roughly, you know, 85 billion on a good day. And um, it's breaking itself up into three pieces. And so effectively, uh, you know, Michelle, there was a, a dead body on the floor and uh, I wanted to know how it got there. And so, uh, you know, as a investigative journalist I, and book writer, I decided, uh, this would be my next great mountain to climb. And uh, it was quite a journey. It was quite hard. It was, uh, you know, three years of my life. Wow, three uh, years. I can't even imagine. I wrote Exo Rich in six weeks. <laughs> yeah, well, normally I can write these books in about two years, but this one uh, was an extra degree of difficulty because I started uh, in 1892 going to the present and uh, you know it's a big important sprawling complicated company with a lot of personalities and um twists and turns but the, the great thing is uh you know for readers is the you know the story is incredible the personalities are incredible i mean you can't beat jack welch uh as a personality and jeff immelt as sort of a foil uh and you know all sorts of crazy things that have happened over the years. So uh, it's an amazing narrative. It's an amazingly gripping story. And I, you know, I think I figured out, you know, what the heck happened in the end, but it took, took a while. So what can you walk us through where you're not giving away the book, but you're wetting their appetite to go out, run out and get it. Mm, uh, yeah. Fine line to walk. <laughs> Yeah. So one thing that, that I know that I read in your notes is that Welch was almost fired after being um, announced as the C as a new CEO because of drunken party at a celebratory party. 
that shot Craig Jones. Yeah, that's that is true. Uh, basically, after Jack, uh, it was announced. I, mean, we, I think we've all had those holiday parties. <laughs> well, this was actually a party to celebrate Jack's selection. Yeah. Uh, as the CEO that was thrown by uh, his predecessor, Reg Jones. And, 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 you know, Reg Jones was like a straight lace, buttoned down, old fashioned sort of, uh, he was born in Britain and moved to to uh, Trenton, New Jersey. Um, uh, and uh, was, you know, went to Wharton, was pretty straight laced and formal. Um, he was a, an advisor to Jimmy Carter, uh, who wanted him to be in the cabinet, but he declined. Uh, the founder, one of the founders of the, uh, you know, the proponents of the business roundtable, um, and Jack was a uh, much more hail fellow, well met, gregarious Irish Catholic guy from uh, north of Boston, Salem, Massachusetts, um, only child. Uh, and, uh, you know, always sort of punched above his weight, uh, 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 literally and figuratively. And, you know, Jack liked to party. And so at this, uh, party that Rick Jones had for Jack upon announcing that Jack, uh, was going to succeed him, it was at the, uh, hotel on Madison Avenue and, you know, Jack just, you know, partied it up and Reg was sort of appalled at Jack's behavior until, uh, uh, and Jack thought he might get fired because Jack, uh, Reg was so upset. But then the next day, all these people who had been at the party were calling Reg saying, you know, what a great guy Jack was and what a great choice uh, Reg had made to choose Jack to be GE CEO. So that was the end of that. Oh, awesome. Yeah, and I was so interested in having you on. That's why we reached out. Is because I'm an entrepreneur. I live, breathe, eat entrepreneurship, and you know, so many businesses go out of business. Um, you know, Steve Forbes, who endorsed my book, Exit Rich, states that 80 to 90 percent of businesses on the market would never sell. And you know, as well as I do, great big brands, you know, they're heroes, and then they go to zero. They go out of business. So I really wanted our listeners to experience and listen to, you know, if this could happen to GE, this could happen to you and really understand the pitfalls and what happened, what went wrong? <laughs> yeah, I say it's a very good point you make. It's a really a cautionary tale because, you know, if it can happen to, you know, one of America's most admired companies and the most valuable company in the world, I mean, why can't it happen to Google or Microsoft or Apple or, you know, whatever the most admired companies are now that we think are sort of in, infallible? Um, and the truth is that uh, mistakes get made. And, you know, Jack made mistakes. Uh, probably one of his biggest mistakes, at least is what he told me, was uh, in selecting Jeff Immelt as his successor. Uh, you know, he thought it was a good idea at the time in 2000. He thought it was the right choice, but uh, ultimately it proved to be uh, the wrong choice or it proved to be that Jeff, you know, did not handle his assignment deftly enough. He would say that Jack dealt him a bad hand. Jack told me repeatedly that he thought he had uh, dealt Jeff Immelt the royal flush and blamed uh, Jeff uh, for uh, misplaying it. I, you know, obviously uh, both are spinning, but uh, I think the truth, no surprise, lies somewhere in the middle. Uh, I think Jack, Jack uh, made mistakes. Um, he and would, be, would have been the first to, you know, admit that. Uh, uh, made mistakes and usually recovered from them. Like I'll give you one example. Like uh, he bought Kidder Peabody uh, in 1986, which was an old line Wall Street investment bank. He uh, he had just bought uh, uh, RCA for 6.4 billion dollars, which was the uh, biggest M&A deal of all time to that point. And of course, RCA owned NBC. That's how GE got uh, NBC back as it turned out in fact uh gE had started uh, uh 
NBC uh, radio uh, network in the 1920s, uh, which is another part of the story. And then they had been forced to divest it in the 1930s. So Jack, anyway, bought it back uh, in 1986. And then he bought Kidder Peabody. He was sort of feeling, you know, hubristic because, uh, you know, the RCA deal was such a good one. And but Kidder Peabody turned out to be a disaster. Uh, first, there was an insider, insider trading scandal involving uh, 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 an M&A a, a banker named Marty Siegel, who had left Kidder and gone to Drexel Burnham, but had done a lot of damage at Kidder before he left. Uh, and then there was another trading scandal involving a guy named Joseph Jett. Uh, and so basically, between the two of those, the firm was kaput. It cost GE a lot more than they thought. But in the end, Jack was able to sell uh, Kidder Peabody or parts of Kidder Peabody to Payne Weber, uh, another brokerage firm for Payne Weber stock. And then, uh, you know, right around the turn of the century, uh, in, you know, 1999 time frame, uh, you know, uh, uh, Payne Weber was sold to UBS, the big Swiss bank, for like $10 billion. And uh, Jack and GE made out, you know, got like $2 billion out of that deal. Uh, and they'd only paid, you know, like $600 million for Kidder. So, you know, long story short, that worked out. Uh, uh, other mistakes Jack made, uh, you know, also kind of worked out. He, he, you you may or may not remember right as Jack uh, was about to retire um, uh, in 2000, uh, GE decided, Jack decided uh, that he wanted to buy Honeywell. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, United Technologies had uh, surprised Jack by agreeing to do a deal for Honeywell. Uh, Jack had looked seriously at buying Honeywell uh, too, but decided it was too expensive. But then when United Technologies announced a deal for Honeywell, taking Jack by surprise, um, he decided that that couldn't be, that GE had to buy it instead. So he made a higher offer. Uh, Honeywell's board eventually uh, went with GE uh, and it was like a $40 billion deal. It would have been the largest deal in GE's uh, history, uh, but uh, and the, you know the U.S. approved the merger, but then the European Union didn't like the idea of the merger and basically said to Jack that he had to divest a bunch of of the businesses of Honeywell, and Jack just did not like that at all. Uh, you know, and he complained to me and to others that it was like uh, you know wanting to buy an 18-hole golf course but only getting 15 holes. Uh, and so Jack decided uh, to uh, walk away from the Honeywell deal uh, in uh, 2001. Uh, and, uh, you know, shortly thereafter, Jeff Immel took over. He took over as CEO uh, four days before September 11th. So, you know, I think in retrospect, um, it would have been a good thing for GE to have completed the Honeywell deal, even though uh, Jack wasn't going to get all uh, that he wanted out of Honeywell uh, because the EU was going to force him to sell some pieces. Uh, not only did Honeywell go on to um, be uh, worth more than GE in the subsequent years, but GE really needed to diversify its uh, income stream away from GE Capital um, and buying Honeywell would have uh, allowed the industrial side of GE to become a bigger part of uh, GE's profitability because, you know, during the 2008 financial crisis, uh, obviously, uh, uh, companies in the financial services businesses uh, you will recall, uh, had quite a tough go of it. Um, and, you know, half of GE's earnings came from GE Capital. It was the largest non-bank bank, bank uh, in the country, um, one of the largest in the world. And uh, even though all of the focus in the uh, 
2008 financial crisis was on uh, Wall Street banks. Really, mm -hmm. GE Capital was in dire straits, almost filed for bankruptcy twice and had to get a bailout, a uh, quiet bailout from Hank Paulson and Sheila Baer, the head of the FDIC. So, uh, you know, I think Jack's uh, made a, two big mistakes. One was, as he said, choosing Jeff Immelt as his successor. The other one was not completing the Honeywell deal. Uh, nevertheless, despite both of those things, you know, when uh, Jack turned the company over to Jeff Immelt uh, uh, on September 7th, 2001, uh, GE was the most valuable company, uh, you know, in the world. And uh, Jack was... Uh, the most uh, respected uh, CEO, and uh, the company was uh, one of the most admired. So it's hard to say that, um, uh, as Jeff does, that he got dealt a bad hand. I'd say he got dealt a pretty good hand that could have been uh, uh, much better, uh, but was still pretty damn good. Uh, and by the time that Jeff took over, you know, four days later, we had 9-11, and of course the world changed dramatically uh, after 9-11, as we all know. Wow. So, so we, can, we can take those lessons and make them relatable to smaller type businesses. You always got to be extremely careful who you hire, who you put in charge, do your vetting. But like you said, there's... Very important. Sports. Yeah, extremely important. But there's always two sides to every story, right? And um, and then acquisitions, you know, acquisitions can be can be really catapult your company to the next level, or it can break your company. So you got to be extremely careful and make sure you do, do your due diligence. That's and I think you also, out of that. Yeah. Yeah, and I think also you have to really, the CEO has to really understand what the drivers of his or her business is. Like you know, GE Capital, you know, was responsible for fifty percent of GE's earnings. And Jeff Immelt, even though he went to Harvard Business School, is more of a marketing guy and I don't think really understood finance or the risks that were embedded in GE Capital or the risks that were embedded in the way GE Capital financed itself, which was borrowing in the short term commercial paper markets and then lending out money on a long term basis. So it was doing you know, the classic mistake that banks make when they get into trouble, which is borrowing short and lending long. And I don't think Jeff Immelt really appreciated the risks that were inherent in that. Um, and, you know, come 2008, when, you know, Bear Stearns went down the tubes and Lehman went down the tubes and Merrill Lynch went down the tubes and Morgan Stanley almost did and Goldman Sachs almost did, you know, it's no surprise that GE Capital was teetering on the brink of bankruptcy as well. When did you leave Wall Street? When did you leave Wall Street? 2004, January 2004. So you didn't you didn't get to be party to to the 2008. <laughs> well, except that I've written two books about the financial crisis. One, yes, House of Cards, yes. uh, which was about the collapse of Bear Stearns, and one, uh, Money and Power, which was about Goldman Sachs, but it's also about how Goldman Sachs avoided the fate that Bear Stearns and Lehman suffered. Yeah, and there's a movie out um, about the Wall Street crisis, too. I forget the name of it. Um, I watched that movie. I forget the name of it. Oh, well, there's been several. One of them was Too Big to Fail, uh, which was about based on Andrew Ross Sorkin's book of the same name. But there have been a number of movies about the financial crisis. I forgot which one I watched. Um, so so those are the three main lessons there. Um what else? What else can you tell us about the rise and fall of American icon? And look, I want to, to take a pause. People ask your questions, you know, ask questions to William, ask him questions about acquisitions, m a the book, anything you want to. He's open to answering questions, right? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> so, so what else was contributing factor to the rise and fall? Well, I think, uh, you know, people, uh, forget, um, you know, how important uh, the technological innovations that GE uh, was responsible for, uh, how important they were to, you know, our everyday lives. Uh, you know, 
light bulb, electric power, uh, air conditioners, uh, refrigerators, microwaves, X-ray machines, uh, MRI machines. GE was uh, one of the first manufacturers of electric cars. Uh, uh, you know, about a hundred uh, plus years ago. Uh, at one point, Henry Ford was working for Thomas Edison uh, in trying to develop uh, electric cars, uh, which GE did manufacture. Um, uh, and then, you know, uh, the problem was uh, back then, which is not too dissimilar from today, although there's been a lot of progress, is that, uh, you know, the charge on the uh, electric, on the batteries for the electric cars back then didn't last that long, whereas you could fill up your car with a, what was then a very inexpensive, you know, uh, tank of gas because they had discovered, uh, you know, oil and that could be refined into gasoline and they had the combustion engine that uh, Henry Ford helped develop that relied on uh, that as well. Uh, uh, you know, that that was much cheaper and much more efficient uh, than an electric car at that point. Um, uh, so that was sort of the end of electric cars back then. Uh, you know, GE uh, created the electric grid in Manhattan. It provided the electricity for the subway systems in Manhattan. Uh, it provided, uh, you know, electricity, you know, up and down, you know, the East Coast. It provided, it made uh, the turbines uh, for other utilities across the country. It made the first uh, uh, jet engines and its uh, jet engines are still the envy of the world and it's creating jet engines that now uh you know can run on hydrogen or even electricity uh that don't require jet fuel and so that's being developed it's providing the engines for a new breed of supersonic jets uh you know it's uh, uh mri machines and x-ray machines and ekg machine you know all those healthcare machines are uh the envy uh, of the world too and so um you know uh, we've of course take all that for granted now it doesn't seem all that new and exciting uh anymore but uh, and then of course you know in the 1920s ge would provide financing to people who wanted to buy refrigerators or stoves uh or uh you know or, or fans or electric clocks or whatever it is because during the uh depression obviously it was very hard to get money to buy those things so g that's how ge capital uh, used to be called ge credit uh you know became a, a very very important uh player in finance is because they financed the acquisitions of these uh, ge products for customers and then um you know ge was of course one of the very first uh, components in, in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And GE was a, uh, mostly, for the longest time, a AAA uh, rated uh, company. So, uh, you know, Jack kind of, Jack Welch sort of fell in love uh, with the idea. And he told me many times it was a lot easier to make money from money than uh, you know, building, manufacturing a jet engine. He fell in love with the idea of arbitraging GE's AAA credit rating uh, so that GE could borrow money very cheaply and then lend it out to borrowers very uh, expensively. And that's the way GE Capital got into, you know, as many as 20 different business lines, uh, which, you know, I learned about when I was working for the chief credit officer. It was just an incredible profit machine uh and you know to jack's credit he sort of understood i think the risks uh, or he had you know management in place at g capital with gary went uh who and dennis naden who understood the risks uh that were uh potential in a non a, a non-bank bank as big as g capital uh, uh so you know jack was sort of like a orchestra conductor 
uh, you know, he had risen up through the ranks of GE, uh, you know, in the plastics division. People yeah. don't remember that uh, uh, GE created, you know, people think back to uh, the movie The Graduate and, you know, Dustin Hoffman being told to, you know, go into plastics because that was the future. Well, GE, Jack was plastics at GE, created Lexan and uh, other GE uh, plastics that, you know, got uh, melted down and turned into cars and all sorts of other things uh, and became incredibly successful, um, you know, since sold to uh, uh, the Saudis. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I think that, uh, people, people forget that, you know, Jack had this ability to orchestrate this incredible collection of businesses and get the most out of people and really, uh, uh turn this into a, uh, a, a well-oiled and reliable earnings machine. Um, and the fact that something that dynamic and that successful and that admired that so widely admired uh uh and so uniquely american uh could uh dissolve uh, uh go down the tubes is kind of and the fact that jack whose you know most important decision was choosing a successor and he kind of blew it and admits to having blown it it's um uh it's rather shakespearean uh and um tragic and a real as i said a real cautionary tale for other companies who think they're kind of invincible can ge recover from this no ge will not recover from this it's being split up into three separate companies a uh a healthcare equipment company uh a power uh electrical power company and a jet engine company so there will be no more ge after this uh there will be no more after 130 years it's kind of sad all right is the name uh, kind of, is it a name change true uh, for these uh, decisions? well the ge the healthcare business is going to be known as ge healthcare mm -hmm. the uh power business is going to be known as ge vernova of all things uh and the jet engine business i believe will still be called ge but you know the ge as we know it will cease to exist it's it's very sad like you said it um and it's happened you know, I mean, to it, uh, a lot of know, big it, brands not just ge it's happens to a lot of big brands go ahead yeah i mean it it's you know uh joseph schumpeter the great when i think he was an austrian economist uh you know, talked about creative destruction. Uh, you know, we sort of see it happening in real time, not only with GE, but, you know, with Facebook, now Meta, you know, uh, you know, he's, Zuckerberg is at least trying to uh, evolve Facebook away from what was an incredibly profitable business uh, into this metaverse company. And the market doesn't really seem to be enjoying it uh, very much. Uh, stock is down 70 percent um but that's you know, so that's it happens true, right as more people get acclimated i think that's going to change don't you on a metaverse mm, i don't think so i think it's no, a big don't? gamble no i don't think anybody I have a client wants, right uh, now that i have a client right now that's 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 working on that and that's a big part of their well plan. we'll see it's uh, the jury is out so what's the big takeaways from power failure a big life the, 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 the danger life. of uh the danger of hype and hubris. You know, Jack probably uh, overhyped the company. Jack mm -hmm. had a way with the media, the business press that covered the company. He had a way with the Wall Street research analysts who covered the company, most of whom did not understand the finance part of GE, did not understand GE Capital or the risks there. Mm -hmm. And then I think Jeff uh, was hubristic. I think uh, he, he he thought he knew better. He didn't really, he, you know, would tell me he liked to listen to everybody and keep good people around him. But, um, he, uh, 
didn't really listen to people as well as he should. He didn't really take the advice of his uh, top people and was content to have them leave if uh, they did not, uh, you know, if they disagreed with him and didn't come around to his way of thinking. Um, you know, I know that's a little harsh. Uh, obviously, he believes uh, uh, that Jeff, Jack did not, as I was saying, did not uh, leave him nearly the hand that uh, Jack thought he had left him. But, you know, uh, you know, maybe he could have, it would have been better, as I said, if Jack had completed the Honeywell deal, did not understand the risks uh, that were inherent in the way GE financed itself, especially on the GE capital side. He didn't listen to people who were trying to tell him about the risks. Bill Gross, the great, you know, king of bonds uh, uh, at PIMCO tried to warn him. Jeff didn't listen. S&P, you know, the credit agencies tried to warn him. He didn't listen. Um, when he spun off GE's insurance businesses into Genworth Financial, he left behind two businesses that would later, uh, you know, come back to haunt GE, you know, you know, 17 years later, 15 years later. Uh, Jeff overpaid for Alstom. He sold NBC Universal too cheaply and in a panic. Um, you know, he dismantled GE Capital after the financial crisis and really had no way to replace those earnings. You know, mistakes were made, as they sometimes say. Well, that happens a lot of acquisitions, you know, that due diligence is is it's rushed and, and buyers don't always do their due diligence and there's always, you know, skeletons in the closet, especially on the smaller transactions. And, you know, the, the seller hypes things up and the buyer doesn't always find you know where the berries yeah. the bodies are buried and so it kind of happens in normal everyday transactions too i mean there's a there's a lot of risk in doing deals and ge did more deals than almost any other company it was a M &A but that machine. was also was was beneficial because it also probably contributed contributed to their growth as well yes but was it was sure. it real growth or was it what i like to call sort of MA growth which is you know growth that it, you know, you, you make an acquisition, you know, uh, you know, it befuddles the analysts because the numbers are all being mashed together and you can't tell what's a restructuring charge and what's a one time charge and goodwill charges and all sorts of impairments. And, you know, yeah. it just sort of obfuscates what's really going on in the P&L of the company for, uh, you know, another year. And if you keep doing uh, uh, acquisitions all the time and divestitures all the time, which they did. I mean, they were really an M&A machine. So if you were an M&A yeah. banker on Wall Street, it would be great to have GE as a client. I mean, you really, a lot, you know, people had a lot of trouble uh, telling, uh, you know, what GE's real earnings were, uh, you know, how much were real and how much were M&A related, how much were restructuring charges, how much were uh, gains on sales, uh, you know, offsetting losses and other parts. And a lot of people complained. They thought that Jack was engaging in accounting shenanigans and that GE was engaged in accounting shenanigans. Um, you know, and they paid fines because of accounting misadventures. I, it was kind of hard to parse through all that. I mean, uh, uh, I, think, uh, I think Jack felt it was very important if he told the street he was going to make a certain amount of earnings that no matter what, he did that, and I think he did that for you know all eighty, or most of the eighty straight quarters that he was CEO of GE. He either you know exceeded, uh, or met or exceeded uh, Wall Street analyst expectations, which helped contribute to uh, you know the incredible increase in value. When Jack took over, GE's uh, market value was twelve billion dollars, and when he was left, it was something like six hundred billion. So what were your biggest takeaways, your biggest lessons from Wall Street? 17 years on Wall Street, got to have some huge lessons, um, some big stories, something. Give us something from Wall Street. Or do, you gonna, or do we have to go read your books? <laughs> well, I would just say, you know, Wall Street's a dangerous place. Uh, <laughs> uh, people forget. Uh, we were reminded in 2008 how dangerous a place Wall Street can be. And it's uh, a dangerous place to work too for your mental 
and physical health. It's rewarding financially, but it's a very difficult place to work. Uh, and uh, it makes people crazy. How long How long do people last on Wall Street typically? What's the average, 10 years? I mean, it burns people out. It's, uh, you know, yeah, the hours so are long. Uh, you know, people treat each other very poorly. Uh, you know, these are generalizations, of course. There's always exceptions. Uh, uh, you know, I spent 17 years. That seemed about as long as I could possibly take it. But, you know, people I started with are still there. 30 years, you know, been there 30 years, 35 years, you know. You know, Felix Rowiton, who, you know, worked at Lazard, you know, he was probably the, you know, banker for 60 years. Wow. So there so are people your... who just do it. Can't imagine doing anything else. And they're working like 70, 80 hours a week, 90 hours a week, right? A the junior people, about. yes, not 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 the senior people. They make the junior people work, you know, <laughs> hundreds of hours a week. So, um, all right, let's. What is your what is your outcome? What do you what what is your biggest dream that will come out of power failure? What is your biggest hope? What, you, what is your biggest dream? Obviously, making the New York Times again. Well, every writer wants to become a New York Times bestseller. Yeah, uh, I'm one of them. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, now, I just, you know, uh, people uh, buy the book, read the book, appreciate, you know, enjoy the story that I tried to tell, that I think I told. Uh, it's an incredible story. It's worth reading. It's a long book. It's a big book. But, you know, How my feeling pages? is, oh, it's about, you know, 750 pages. Wow. Three uh, years. Uh, I made you. Uh, you know, my view is if I'm reading a book that I'm really enjoying, then more of it is good. So that's the kind of book I guess I write for that way of thinking. You know, I try to make it as interesting and exciting uh, the whole the whole way through. But yeah, it's long, but it's a important big story to tell, and so that's why I did it. Mine's 325 pages, so you're double double the size. And um, so you really got to be passionate about this to, to dedicate three years. One of the questions that came in was, does William have any advice for those writing books, finding a good age of publisher, et cetera? Because, you know, everybody says you don't make money off of writing the books. You have to have a good ROI, return on investment, good way to, to capture those leads. You know, uh, that's why I write books is, is brand awareness, uh, lead capture, et cetera. But you know what's your thoughts what's your advice there well i'm not capturing any uh leads. Well, you're not you're a well-known uh, author well i don't know whether i am or not but i, I mean this is what i do now having yeah. been a banker um this is what i do what do you like better yeah. banking or writing oh there's, <laughs> there's no question but you know had i not been a banker i couldn't be this kind of writer so you know uh you know there's there, 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 it was a synergistic uh, relationship uh, between the two. Uh, but, you know, I have a much better life now. Uh, you know, I, I have my own equity. Uh, I control my own hours. Uh, you know, I can be where I want, when I want. Nobody's telling me what to do or how to do it or when to do it. So that kind of freedom you know, you can't put a price on that. And that's the opposite of what you have when you're uh, you know, a banker on Wall Street. You have no freedom. Everybody's yeah. always telling you what to do. And, you know, success has many fathers and failures an orphan. <laughs> That's a great line. I love that. Repeat that line one more time. Success has many fathers and failure is an orphan. An orphan. All right. So what do you have any advice for for those um, listening that would like to get into writing, would like to write a book, writing a first book, second book, third book? I've written three. Any any advice on that? Well, well, I'm sure it's no writing. different than, than what you could offer, but it's really hard work. You have to be dedicated to it. It's like a full-time job. You have to put your butt in the chair every day and your fingers on the keyboard. And you have to, you know, have a passion for the topic because it's going to be lonely and there's going to be no one helping you. So, you know, how, how, you don't do it, nobody's going to get it done. That's right. And then, and then you got, and then you can, you know, come up against mental writer's block as well, uh, which has never really affected me because all the contents in my head, I know what I'm writing about, so I don't really face writer's block, but I know many other writers do. 
Uh, what, what advice do you have of finding a good agent, publisher, things of that nature? Any good advice well, on you, that? You have you probably do need to have an agent to get yeah. to the publishers because that's the the it's agents are the gating the gating issues. Yeah. yeah but once you're a short time bestseller, it's much easier to get in front of the publishers. But any any agents you recommend? Or any way to, to find good agents doing you know? yeah, word of mouth i think is probably word of mouth you know, talk, talk talk to your friends uh who are writers and ask them who their agent is and if they would recommend well can you her. say who your agent is and if you recommend your agent because you're my good friend sure. <laughs> i'm talking to uh, my agent is a woman named joy harris, who's, joy harris. It, she has her own uh literary agency and She's been my agent uh, for 20 years now. All right, we'll put that in the comments, Troy Harris, and she's really good. All right, awesome. That's so true. what's next for you, William? I mean, you've, you've dedicated three years to this book. I'm sure you've got other books in the pipeline. What's next for William? I'm going to, you know, uh, Michelle, as you know, it's not enough to write a book. You also have to sell a book. So I'm now oh, I know. going into... <laughs> to selling the book mode uh, for the next, you know, certainly till the beginning of January. And then I'll take a deep breath, take stock and see where I am and see if I have the energy to do this again. To me, the selling part is harder than the writing part, you know, for sure. Um, but yeah, but so you're going to do the selling part, get on your terms bestseller. Do you have any projects in mind? I'm, I'm, you might not be able to talk well, about I have them. ideas. Uh, I'm not ready to talk about them, but I have, uh, I have ideas. Yeah. We'll have to see where the market is, what, what might be interesting, uh, what's going to interest me, uh, and what's going to interest my publisher. And you might have one book being turned into the movie, right? Yes. But you know, many a slip between cup and lip. <laughs> you know, so you never know. So, how do we? How do? How do our? Okay, so where should our listeners go buy the book? Are we in pre? Are you in pre sale? Yeah, okay. sure. Amazon, anywhere, anywhere you want to go. Amazon, Barnes and Noble. I'm sure you're gonna be in Hudson stores everywhere. Sure, wherever okay. your books are sold. Any last minute tips, strategies, advice? Um, most of my listeners are entrepreneurs. Uh, typically starting in business, but most of them are very successful entrepreneurs looking for access, which I do help them with, of course. Don't give up. Don't lose faith. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't lose faith. What keeps you going? Just that. Just that, just, huh? Just, got, I'm on a mission. I have a job to do. You know, journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. So you just got to keep after it every day. Well, you You've been an amazing guest. Thank you for so much for coming on. And, you know, I can't wait to hear about your next project when you make the New York Times bestselling author, which I know you will. We'll have you back on because I know it's going to be a great story. Well in demand. Um, thank you so much for coming on, William Cohen. You've been a thank great you. guest. Thank you to my audience. Thank you to all the Exit Rich subscribers. If you haven't subscribed, make sure you go subscribe to Exit Rich. Make sure you share this episode with your friends, your colleagues, your fellow entrepreneurs, share it with your network. Get the word out there. Let's help William Cohen become another, a fourth time, fourth time, right? Fourth time yeah. you know, best-selling yeah. author. Yeah. Let's yeah. make it happen. You know, we're entrepreneurs, happen entrepreneurs. So let's make that happen. Thank you, William, so much for coming Thank on. Thank you, Michelle. Great guest. Take care. Thank you. Let's all just exit rich if we can. Yes, let's all exit rich. Amen to that. <laughs> Thank you again, William. Thanks Take to care. all of us. Bye bye. Thanks for listening to the Exit Rich Podcast. Don't forget to check out Michelle Seiler Tucker's Build to Sell Blueprint books and Exit Rich, along with more blogs, videos, and resources at exitrichpodcast.com. Be sure to connect with Michelle on Facebook or LinkedIn and stay tuned for her next episode by subscribing in your favorite podcast player.